Good morning, everybody. Hello, um, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, um, Food and Beverage Market Exporting to Singapore and ASEAN. Uh, my name is David Kelly, and I'm the Executive Director of the British Chamber of Commerce. And on behalf of the Chamber, um, a very warm welcome to you all. A very good morning. We are excited to be holding this session today, um, given the unprecedented times that we find ourselves within. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your patience for those that originally signed up to the original event um, in the middle of in the middle of March. Um, thank you for your patience as we move this to an online um, a program. Um, we're pleased to have um, around about 80 people actually sign up for the event itself. It's great to see sort of 54 of you online already. Um, but just quickly, some some first things, some some housekeeping, uh, just to just to get us started. Um, please do turn off your calendar, your email, your sound notifications if you haven't done already. And if you can set your microphone to mute, that would be much appreciated. Please also turn off your video to support bandwidth issues. Um, that would be great. Um, the session will be recorded and understanding that many of you have other meetings and other commitments as well and other challenges from working from home. We will ensure that the recording or, and the, certainly the slides will be emailed to you after this session and for those that were unable to join us this morning. Following the presentations, we'll also be answering questions. So um, there is a, an opportunity for you to post some questions um, through the system, um, which can be answered in the Q&A session at the end. So a quick run through of the agenda. Um, I'll give a quick overview of, um, of the British Chamber of Commerce and what we're doing in Singapore. Um, we'll then um, hand over to Insight to give uh, an update on the Singapore and ASEAN um, food and beverage retail market, and then have an update from um, the UK ASEAN Business Council and their activities as well. Um, and then we'll have time for some questions and answers um, for you too. I'm really pleased to introduce our speakers. Um, so uh, Emma, who's the Emma Ross, who's the general manager and head of business development for Insight, um, along with her colleague who will be sharing some case studies as part of her presentation, Cameron Gordon, who's the partner and head of client growth also for Insight, um, followed by Paul North, um, the ASEAN trade advisor for the UK ASEAN Business Council. Thank you very much to the speakers. I'd also like to thank Insight, the British Chambers of Commerce, the Department of International Trade, and in particular, make reference to uh, the international trade advisors as well, who have been so supportive of this in communicating this event um, for their support, um, uh, and the UK ASEAN Business Council for your support. Um, this sort of event is something that we're going to be doing a lot more of. So the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore is um, uh, one of, one of the main sort of British Chamber hubs across the ASEAN region. We see a lot of UK companies come through to us to export the rest of the ASEAN region. Um, part of the purpose of this event, and uh, again, a huge thanks to Emma, who supports us with, with our F&B committee here in Singapore, is that we want to start really supporting UK companies and provide the opportunity for them to, uh, for, for you to sort of see um, the opportunities in Singapore and the ASEAN region and provide you with that background. So this will be the first of a series of events that we put on um, looking at different sectors to help profile um, opportunities in the region to help the UK companies to export. And now is a great time as we're um, a lot of us are working from home um, uh, from wherever we are to, to look at those markets and help us to go up for growth in the future. So a little bit of an overview about Singapore. Um, it is quite a small market. Um, there are five point, only 5.6 million people here in Singapore, but there is a big proportion of a, a big, a large percentage of a, a middle class um, a demographic. So there is a, a relatively um, good, a good amount of spend here. Um, Singapore is, um, it's geographically quite small, but in terms of its location, it's fantastic in terms of being uh, a place where companies can set up they can, uh, to look at exporting across the ASEAN region. We see a number of companies set up their businesses here and we help them to expand across other, other Southeast Asia countries to, um, to, to, get, their, to get their market growth. Um, it is considered the second easiest country in the world to do business in. Um, so it is very, very business friendly. It's very easy to set up a company. It's very easy to get a bank account. Um, there is um, a low level of unemployment. There is a, a good level of talent. The education system here is very, very strong. 
And so it is a great place to start thinking about exploring in terms of markets outside of the UK and the EU uh, in terms of access to uh, the Asia Pacific region. So about the chamber, um, we're a fairly large chamber. We represent about 400 corporates here, um, with roughly around about, um, about 4,000 individual members. And really our purpose since 1954 has been to build networks, connect businesses and create opportunities, ensuring that we are supporting companies um, to help them to grow, set up, et cetera, uh, in Singapore here. We're very well connected in terms of our, our British connections. We work very closely with the Singapore High Commission. Um, and the British Council from an educational perspective and the Department of International Trade, which I'll come on to in a minute. Um, and we also have a great relationship with the British Club from a, from a social um, um, perspective. So, um, you know, working in collaboration with our partners really supports uh, British companies as they come over here to Singapore. Um, and as I mentioned, we're very well connected with our other um, our chamber colleagues across the region. Um, I have a good relationship with my counterparts. Um, helping to support and handhold companies that are looking at other markets to try and provide that insight quickly, coherently and easily um, for companies that are looking at other markets. Um, so we do work and pass companies and help them and provide those soft landing pads in those countries, in those in those in regional markets as well. In terms of Singapore, um, and certainly particularly over the last couple of months with the, uh, the activity that's been happening at the moment with COVID-19, we've got a very, very strong relationship with the Economic Development Board, um, the Ministry of Manpower. Uh, we have a regular dialogue with them in terms of um, uh, updates in terms of employment passes and what's happening from a, from a manpower perspective. We've got a great relationship with the Ministry of Trade and Industry in Singapore, supporting um, the growth of companies, helping to create jobs, looking at seeing how we can support um, further exports uh, with Enterprise Singapore and with the Singapore Business Federation. So um, we act as that conduit and that representational body to support companies that are, are, are setting up here or already established here to help them with um, access to up-to-date information from Singapore Inc and passing that through. Our membership is very uh, very, very broad. Um, we have a, a number of sectors that we cover. Um, I mentioned that um, Emma is uh, involved in our F&B um, um, committee, which we've just set up. Um, these, these are really a profile, uh, a program to support companies to, um, to sort of really get involved. So we have a number of committees, but representation from uh, our membership is, is, is all across the board. It's a very, very diverse marketplace here. One of the things that does set us apart from, from other chambers is our trade service activity. Um, we provide a service which allows companies to um, gain market research, um, to jump onto trade shows, to provide access to uh, potential customers, to support with product launches, to support with networking events, helping you to get in front of your customers. Um, we're doing some work at the moment with the Welsh government um, to try and support um, uh, six or seven uh, food and beverage brands to uh, be business matched with their potential buyers as well. So we're doing some sort of virtual trade mission work at the moment. Um, and of course, we, we support um, uh, the Department of International Trade and various other organizations that run um, sector specific trade missions into the region as well. We provide networking events, etc. cetera, um, key high level speakers, um, provide access to potential customers and, and help to support that journey that, that UK brands are on when they look to export. Uh, we have a number of sterling members ranging from banks to um, uh, in investment houses, the automotive sector, um, through to educational um, uh, customers, legal services, um, the oil and gas sector. Um, and, and really, it's, it is very, very broad. We're supported by some huge brands here. And what this means for companies when they come into region and, and our membership more broadly is that we can quite easily pair you with a number of our, 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 our key members to allow you to have um, um, further support when you're coming into the market. So I mentioned our trade services team. Uh, this is some of the services that we provide in terms of in-market support. We do help to facilitate those trade missions, that market research, as I, as I mentioned, but we provide that advice, we provide that consultative support. So 
helping you to navigate some of the some of the challenges. Um, we're working with a company at the moment in the oil and gas space that's looking at um, some some specific grants that are available in Singapore to trial a, an R and D program linked with a government agency here. So we help with the on the ground um, uh, access to content, to finance, to support, to customer acquisition. Um, through our advisory services um, linked to business matching, helping to get you in front of your potential customers um, and to help run very targeted events to help, help try and get your, your, your potential customers, your potential clients to an event which you can host. One of the things we have launched, and this is this is a soft launch, so um, you're, you're, you're one of the first of the groups to see this. Um, we have launched an online trade portal. It's been soft launched online on our website. Um, the, the link is there, but it allows us to um, capture some information about your products, your brands, your services, um, and help channel those in the right way. Um, check whether you're export ready, provide the right advice. Um, some companies looking for access to capital and funding, we have opportunities there. Uh, we've got a list of um, opportunities that are already available to, in the market already on the website. Um, there's some advice on how you set up your business. There's some information about what Singapore's like to trade in. So that online portal is a completely free resource um, and you can put in, uh, there are some forms online which you can you can fill in there as well. Um, probably not so relevant now, but when you are looking at the uh, looking at the market, when things do start to st settle down, um, we have got a great relationship with British Airways, who have opened up a 15% discount for flights originating from the UK to come to Singapore. Um, so if you are coming on a trade mission, if you are coming to explore the market, we can help you to get access to favourable rates on, um, with with the national carrier. And we can also help you to get favorable rates with our, our partners in Singapore. We can provide you with an in-market briefing. We can look after you on your journey when you come over here and provide that support and that access and help you to navigate other markets within Asia as well. Um, so we have got a series of committed partners such as British Airways to support with that program. And we cover a whole range of sectors. Um, those that are highlighted in green are where we've got business committees. So we have members that already sit within those committees to provide again that soft landing to help you in market and there is a highlight of some of the business group committees that we have already as well we've published a number of thought leadership pieces through our magazine this is available online which you can get hold of um, it's kept absolutely up to date with some some key potent very interesting topics from our membership and, and, and from the region as well. So I would advise you to download um, a copy of this and keep yourself refreshed with the market. And you have got access to that. It is available to non-members as well. So I would encourage you to, to, to keep an eye on what's going on in the market already through our magazine. And we run a series of events. And of course, like this event that's, that's being run digitally and not face to face, a lot more of our content will be available. Um, so I would advise you to check the website and keep up to date with what's going on. And for those of you that are interested and, and sort of committed to looking at the Singapore market, we do have a favourable uh, membership rate for companies that are based in the UK that aren't currently set up here. So you can start to get access to much more in-depth content as a, as a, as a member benefit. Um, so I, I would encourage those that are keen um, to look at the market to, to get involved and we can help you through that process. And we have a number of other member offers of which, you know, if you became a member, you can start putting them in there as well to provide discounts on, on various other support offers as well. And we're very active across social media, so please do follow us on our, on our key channels. So we do look forward to welcoming you to the market soon. That's just a very sort of quick snapshot, a quick welcome from me at the British Chamber of Commerce. Um, I will be picking up a bit later from, uh, from the question and answer session, so look forward to speaking to you too, soon. In the meantime, I'm going to hand over to uh, Emma Ross um, from Insight, for um, the next part of the presentation.
Good morning, everybody. Um, it's uh, lovely to speak to you all. Um, some of you that I've uh, spoken to in the past and some, some new people, which is great. Um, thank you, David, for your clear, concise presentation and handover. Um, just to warn you all, we're sat in the middle of a, a thunderstorm here in Indonesia, so I apologize if uh, there's any interruption with uh, the sound or communication. Um, this morning, I'm going to be delivering to you um, uh, a strategy for exporting food and beverage uh, products to not just Singapore, but the, the ASEAN markets. Um, I'd like to again, without repeating David, thank you to, to him and the team at the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore, the UK ASEAN Business Council and the Department of International Trade, who have all been helpful in um, supporting, conducting and making this event actually happen today. It was supposed to be uh, happening face to face in London, um, but in uh, unprecedented times, this is it, and we're doing it virtually. So I hope you find it all of great interest um, and uh, I'm, I'm ready to, to crack on. So as David said, my name is Emma Ross. I'm the uh, general manager here. Um, I've been living out in Asia for over 20 years now, um, and I'm the um, general manager and head of business development for, for Insight. My um, one of our partners, Cameron Gordon, um, is uh, is dialing in for this also, who will be uh, conducting the second half of the presentation, looking at how the current market dynamics have affected exports, giving you some live feedback from our distributors across in, in the markets we work in and a couple of live case studies, which I think you'll you'll all find of interest. Sorry. So yeah, I've spoken to you about uh, insight, the, the big opportunity, some of the some of the key considerations when exporting to our region and um, in Singapore, which is really a, a big gateway to Asia. So those are the parts that I will be covering. So who are we? Um, for those of you that I haven't spoken to or met, we are a food and beverage export development agency, um, specialising in the high growth markets in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. We have offices in Indonesia and Singapore and teams of people on the ground in the markets that we operate in. So um, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, across to South Korea and Australia. Um, we work with a, a multitude of brands. Um, you can have us look on the right hand side of there, some of the clients we work with. I think what's really important to, to share with you all is there's no one size fits all client that we deal with. We specialize and our, our, our speciality is in food and beverage only. Um, but within that are categories of entrepreneurs, for example, that have um, designed and, and brought a product to launch in their first year or two. Um, and we work with them very much in a commercial perspective to get them ready to enter into markets. Some examples that you may recognize on there from that may be Jude's Ice Cream um, or Ember Snacks to SMEs, which have maybe tried to um, export to Asia before, um, or household brands that have um, dominated their category in the UK, um, but are wanting to try and export to Asia, but already, or, or already in Europe or the US or the UAE, right through to global brands that we've all heard of, like the Asahis, um, the Chiabanis, the Kraft Heinz, who are already in markets across Southeast Asia, but want to expand those um, sales channels and make sure they're optimizing them um, and exploring different categories. So um, we, we work with a, a huge range of clients um, across the world, but some of the UK ones that you will probably all recognize in there, and also through to brands that are really carving out new markets um, and new categories, such as Meatless Farm in there, which are going very strong in the, uh, the meatless sector. So the three main parts to our services, market analysis, um, which really targets the, the right sales channels to make sure that your product's in the right place, the right positioning, um, and that you're fully aware of what the investment is required um, to go into each market, through to market validation, which is looking at whether there's a genuine opportunity there, identifying your sales pitch, making sure that all we're getting the samples are through to distributors, and what the market feedback actually looks like through to the uh, final stage, which is the most all important sales and distribution. Um, so negotiating the actual 
distribution, uh, sorry, appointment of the distributor and facilitating your first purchase order. Um, that's a very, very quick synopsis of our service and, and, and how we position ourselves and probably something that we could uh, look at with our Q&A session at the end of our presentation. Uh, the categories that we cover, we could highlight it there on the right. So as the end, the big opportunity, I, I won't go into too much detail of this, as I know Paul, who's speaking after me, um, has, has got a, a very comprehensive overview of this piece. I think really what I wanted to point out on here, which is pretty obvious to, to everybody that um, uh, knows anything about global economies, that um, the, 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 our region is, is huge. Our whole economic block uh, is uh, worth $2.95 trillion. Um, all I would say on this is the Asia market is very different from the US and the European markets that have also very big um, economies. Uh, there's lots of opportunity here for F&B brands. Um, and um, there's a lot of demand, especially for, for, for new F&B um, products in our region. Again, Paul will talk about a little bit more about this in, in his presentation. And David kindly mentioned about the uh, Singapore in particular uh, in terms of its population um, and its, uh, its GDP. But as you can see from here, we've got some large numbers across Asia uh, and it's an exploding middle, middle class. All very complex and individual markets, but I think the main point, key point takeaway from this is really that Singapore is a great starting block, although a small amount of people um, are higher, higher levels of disposable income and a bit of a flagship landmark country for F&B products in Asia. So what does it look like? What do the supermarkets, the retail, what does it actually look like in our region? Um, there are a lot of retailers here. Um, they fall into two groups, really, regionally uh, and domestically. The regional ones, um, you might be looking at those logos on the right there, and some you may recognise. I mean, Tesco, we, we all know we all know who they are. There's someone there you've probably never heard of. Um, the regional ones include Dairy Farm, which own Cold Storage, Welcome, and Giant. And more of a domestic um, um, supermarkets like Fair Price, which is very big and but only Singapore relevant and owned by the Singaporean government. We have 120 major supermarket retailers um, and 7,993 7, supermarket um, outlets. This is a uh, slide that I particularly feel is very poignant to uh, to share with you. And, it's a, and a, you know, sitting in the UK and looking at for those that, that aren't exporting into Asia, like what do these supermarkets look like? This is the example. This was taken from the Central Food Hall in Bangkok in Thailand. This is an example of a modern, sophisticated um, supermarket they have there. Um, you can see on the left-hand side, the, the forefront of the left-hand side, you've got some very local, traditional Thai um, products. Sitting behind that, you've got some marketing for some regional um, Thai and surrounding area um, goods. And on the right-hand side, you can see there's a huge move now towards ethically sourced products. So the, the uh, free range um, and all very international. Um, we're seeing an increasing number of world-class grocery stores. This is a snapshot, really. Um, I wanted to show you what, how international the, the uh, supermarkets here are. This is just a snapshot of the cheese section um, in cold storage in Singapore. 95% um, of the brands that you can see there in front of you are all imported. It's an international marketplace. Unlike in the UK, you will be competing domestically with maybe one or two international players on the shelves. But really, um, when you're talking about the, the markets here, it really is an international playing field. Consumers really want the best um, and the platform for the rest of South. Getting your product on the shelf in Singapore is really the, provides the platform for the, the rest of Southeast Asia. So what are the key considerations when looking at the ASEAN market? Um, I'm going to talk to you about access and barriers, market entry model, channels investment, some a brief competitive landscape giving you some examples of what that could look like and how important your pricing strategy is. 
This is a busy slide, um, but a very important one, and everybody will have a copy of this afterwards to be able to look at this in more depth. I think that the key takeaway from this really is the every single country is very complex and different um, FDA regulations or uh, pre-export um, requirements that they need to go through to get into market. Um, it highlights that Singapore generally is, as, as David echoed in his, his um, presentation, is a very easy first step with low bar barriers to entry. Um, when you look at some of the more complex markets, but maybe with the bigger prize in terms of volumes, if you're looking at Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, um, you've, 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 you've got a lot more um, regulations that you need to consider. Um, it's a simple, Singapore is a simple place to do business. Um, but it's important to understand the consumer, the country requirements, and holistically look at the region against what your Asia strategy is before just picking a country. Um, this is a typical timeline of start to finish in terms of getting your product on the shelf. And in our experience, in the 10 years that we've been doing this on the ground in Asia, um, this is a, a typical timeline of traditionally the, um, the milestones that is involved. Now, if you are looking, and, and Cameron will talk to you a bit more about a case studies where we have done this quicker um, in Singapore, and um, I know out of the region that I'm talking about at the moment, but in Hong Kong, um, you could be looking at three to six months beginning from ex exploring the, uh, the opportunity to getting onto the shelf. For some of the other countries with tighter FDA regulations and importing procedures, you could be looking at six to nine months. That's why this piece is important now and in the, the times that we're seeing in the world that this, this, we have time to do this review now while, while business is as it is. There's a lot of different market entry models, and I think uh, in my particular experience from helping and assisting UK brands into the Asia region that um, many people use a mixture of um, distributors and consolidators, um, all with very different ways of operating, not only within the UK, within Europe and America. Asia is no different. It's a very complex mix of um, uh, import and export partners. These are the four in our experience that we um, traditionally see here um, and very much work with the importer and distribution model. Again, I won't go through the advantages and disadvantages of each, but that's something you can, you can read um, offline. Um, key considerations then for um, looking, making your uh, market entry. Um, the appointment of the local distributor, I think, is really the key. Getting into your the right distributors on on the on the ground in the region, in the country that you're operating, in making sure you're in the right store, the right price, um, and the right volumes will help you to skyrocket your sales in that region. Um, having that on the ground local distributor um, improves all of the next pieces that I'm going to talk to you about. The first one being credibility. So linking with a distributor that already has international brands and strong brands in your category is very important. Linking with one that has a good merchandising capability. Um, there's an example there with um, what a fabulous merchandising looks like. But if that isn't happening, if you're maybe using a consolidating model, there's no control over if your stock is, if you're out of stock, who's, who's stocking um, or fulfilling your planogram and how good does your product actually look on that shelf. Marketing is really important. Um, so in, in, in Asia itself, I mean, what works in um, Singapore doesn't work in Thailand, doesn't work in Indonesia. So making sure you're partnering with a distributor that supports this local spin and really understands the nuances in between each, each not only each country, but each, each city within that um, and logistics. Um, a distributor that has a great logistic channels um, will oversee everything from your your product at port to the, on, on the shelf in the country that, that you're selling in. Um, it will also help to avoid all out of stock problems um, and make sure that you're communicating frequently and regularly. And I think that's a really important insight there. 
Um, the way that the distribution model, distributor model works here is that they will oversee that um, whole export from the port in the UK through to on the shelf here, taking away that absolute headache of not knowing how much, when, what price and where your product will be going. This is what an underperforming distributor could look like. Um, again, it's a classic example. Um, without a local distributor on the ground, um, having that having that um, insight is really difficult. And this is what it could end up looking like without with you having absolutely no knowledge about it at all. Um, so it's very important to, to choose carefully. So yes, it can be expensive to enter into major grocery channels as in Southeast Asia. Um, it's important to know what your strategy is. Are you looking to build your brand in the region? Which so it flags, flag, sorry, flagship countries like Singapore tend to be the first port of call. Um, ASEAN as a region um, has different different itineraries, but making sure that you understand culturally communication and the consumer buying habits in each of those regions is critical to make sure that you're getting the return on investment. Knowledge is key. Um, Asia is unlike anywhere else um, and I'm sure everybody in every region says that but uh, Asia really is about business relationships, history and is very unique in the way it conducts business. Knowing this and having access to the right information and where to put your product in the best places um, it will help you give your best return on investment um, you know there may be 48 fair prices in in Singapore but your product might be only relevant for 18 of those um, these are the kind of valuable insights that sitting in the UK you're just not going to be able to know this is a, uh, a fantastic example of a very busy category the um, chip not chip category, crisp category um, in uh, in Singapore. Um, as you can see there, you've got very famous UK brands, probably the only one there that's got a double facing. Um, but unless you're walking the aisles there and you can see what the promotions are, you can see what your competitors are doing, it's very difficult from desktop research to get an understanding of what your category looks and feel, feels like. and pricing, probably one of the, the key pieces um, or pitfalls, should I say, of when export, exporting your product. Um, it's just not enough to come up with an export price and, and, and give to distributors. It's really important to understand what is sustainable and what is normal in each market. Um, we use a very um, specialised reverse price modelling strategy to make sure that we know what your distribution price is that you need, what the distributors need and it still makes sense to the consumer um, here in market. Um, it can really turn off distributors and it's very hard to get the door open again um, as Cameron will explain in one of our, our, our pieces on feedback from distributors in the region on, on, on what turns them on and off with uh, UK brands. But is your price realistic and sustainable? So summarising the uh, Singapore piece, um, it's a good starting point. It's a natural entry point for Asia. Um, it really is the gateway to the, the rest of the region. The regulations are clear. It's easy to do business here. There's no lengthy FDA reg registration or charges to labels. Um, there's very little or no import duty. Um, and it's, your supply chain can be managed extremely well here. So again, there's a picture here of a cold storage in Singapore. I mean, that could be any supermarket in any major city in the world, in London or the US or, or Europe. Um, I think one of the, the biggest takeaways on, on, on this piece is really that Singapore imports 90% of its food and beverage products. It's a huge market um, for F&B. It's modernized, it's strong, it has a large, wealthy expat community of well-traveled locals and its English is its official language of business. Okay, that wraps up the first piece of our presentation. I'd like you to hand I'd like to hand over now to my colleague Cameron Gordon.
Uh, hello, I'm just waiting for the, the handover. In the interim, if anybody has any questions, please do feel free to feel free to pop them through um, on the on the question element of this webinar. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me just go back to the the start of my presentation. Uh, my name is Cameron Gordon. Uh, I'm one of the the directors at uh, at Insight. Um, thanks to everybody for joining today. Uh, thank you to the to, to Britcham. Thank you to the, the Business Council and also the Department of International Trade again uh, for putting this uh, this session together. I think it, it's very helpful. So um, let me uh, first start out uh, with the the elephant in the room, I guess, um, with with COVID nineteen and and what it really means, I guess, for um, for developing new export markets in our region. So as of uh, as of today, I guess um, supermarkets are still open uh, and consumers are still shopping. Uh, the grocery sector is um, seeing a massive surge in online sales, um, which is causing some problems with some uh, providers such as um, Lazada and some of the, the the larger platforms experiencing uh, crashes and the like with their systems. Uh, but um, you know, if you if you've been following the news uh, with regard to Singapore, um, you know, consumers are still out and about. Uh, there is some disruption, obviously, like there is everywhere. Um, but um, the market is still open. Uh, retail buyers in Singapore and and in some of the other markets uh, that we work in across the region um, have generally switched to. Um, switch their meetings to, to video conferences as opposed to meeting in person, which again is causing some challenges. Um, distributors are still considering uh, new opportunities for grocery. Um, food service, obviously, as it is in the UK and elsewhere, uh, is a real challenge. Uh, but like Emma said earlier, um, we're kind of trying to take the, the positives out of the, the current environment and it does give us all a chance to, let's say, get our ducks in a row and to, to to do better planning and prepare in more detail prior to actually going out and trying to uh, trying to develop sales because you only do get one chance to make a good impression and it is really important that when you are going to market you're going with a, a well thought out strategy that you understand the the key elements of pricing um, you know the promotion strategies distribution uh, and the like and also the the investment that's, that's required to enter some of these markets. Uh, bear with me. Okay, we we did a survey recently of 535 um, food and beverage distributors that we work with across uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in addition to Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea, uh, where we also work. Uh, we did the survey in uh, in February of this year. Now I'm just going to talk at a, at a very high level, uh, but I think there are some good uh, there are some good trends and some good um, you know, obvious go-tos um, with some of these outputs uh, that 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 we were given from from these distribution food and beverage distributors. So, in terms of the the most sought after categories, uh, generally uh, that that w the categories that we're seeing demand in are snacks, biscuits, uh, beverages, and protein are, are trending very well. Um, we also asked the question, knowing that we had this event coming up, about what these distributors saw as the perceived strengths of UK brands. Um, I think the the outputs of that were, were pretty pretty steady. Um, UK brands are generally seen as as being quality products with good branding elements, uh, innovation, and, and good quality packaging. Um, you know, labelling obviously, um, country of origin is is important in the markets that we work in, uh, in terms of those perceptions of quality, food safety, uh, and you know, better for you claims as well. Some of the perceived barriers um, for UK brands uh, in terms of perceptions um, that these distributors have, these food and beverage distributors have of um, of UK brands, uh, concerns around pricing uh, were, were, was the obvious one. 64% of distributors said that they had a general concern about the 
the export pricing and whether that export pricing can hit a uh, you know a viable and sustainable position within the market. Now, uh, export pricing is of course only one small element of of the the margin chain. So we put a lot of work uh, into into working with the distributors that we work with to really truly understand um, the the price build. So obviously you've got your export price that you're putting forward. Uh, you need to understand, you know, the the typical distributor margin for for each retailer in each country in each market. You need to understand the the retailer margins. That's both on the front front margin and the back margin to really understand where you're going to arrive on the shelf uh, based on your export price. As Emma said, we're very strong on price modelling to to firstly understand. Uh, we first. Ver Take a very good look at what the category is doing, then uh, try and establish a, a position in that category for our clients, and then we work that back through that price model to arrive at a an export price that perhaps needs a little bit of tinkering with, uh, but the, that will ensure that we we achieve a, a sustainable position within the market. Because unfortunately, you know, if if pricing is out, uh, what does that mean? It means that. Um, you're out of the cat you're out, out of range of the category, which means that your sales are not going to be as strong as you'd perhaps like them to be. Your distribution is going to be limited. Uh, you're going to be on regular sale because you're not selling it at, at regular pricing, which can cause concerns for, for the retailer in terms of the the let's just say the retail the return on investment that the retailer is getting from from your product on their shelf. In terms of the the products that distributors associate the, the UK with, uh, biscuits, uh, beverages, dairy, uh, meat in terms of pork and beef, snacks, um, all have a, a prominent uh, position uh, within the perceptions of distributors about what the UK is strong at. Uh, I think this this uh, this, sli this slide on the left is pretty important about what's important to distributors. Pricing, of course, we've talked a little bit about. Um, but one that we're consistently asked about when pitching new brands to the distributors that we work with is around our clients positioning within their home market. So how are they tracking within their home market, within their category? Are they the category leader? You know, are they, are they, you know, what percentage are they are they grown on an annual basis, for example? And if you can provide those uh, those very uh, useful um, let's say category rankings or uh, that the the retailers provide on a regular basis to, so, to show your position within the market that's very useful if you can pass that along to the distributors that you're targeting the last uh the last uh, graph is around um you know the demand on distributors time i think and i think what's important to remember is that uh you know even before covid and, and the challenges there you know, European markets, US markets, a number of big block markets around the country, uh, sorry, around the world are already, already relatively saturated. So everybody currently, or up until COVID anyway, and, and, and coming in up in the future as well, uh, everybody's looking at Asia for growth. Um, so it's really important that, you know, when you do go to market and you do make that you know, you, you do put that effort and that investment into to going to pitch to distributors that you've really got your ducks in a row and you understand, you know, what your strategy is and, and how your strategy fits within that market. Because, you know, some distributors are getting approached every day with new brands, some one to two times a week, you know, and, and the majority are getting, you know, uh, they're getting approached uh, regularly to, uh, on a monthly basis. So um, you've got to really think about how you can make your pitch stand out. I just want to cover off some some case studies here just quickly um, in terms of how a general uh, process generally works in terms of st the start from you know wanting to go into a, a specific export market right through to getting your product on the shelf in the market. So I've got two case studies here about how the, a, a system that we have kind of developed over 10 years and, and how we typically do it. Uh, the first month generally starts with the strategy, so that's a distribution audit of, of the target market, um, understanding the, the target grocery channels and the costs, um, understanding the competition, and then the price modeling to, to make sure that we're going to hit the shelf at the right price. Um, distribution, uh, that typically for us is around engaging 
category relevant distributors uh, that obviously have experience in the category, uh, but that don't have obvious conflicts with the brands that, that, that we're pitching. Um, in this case, uh, we approached 14 distributors for, for one of our yogurt brands, had four confirmed interests uh, in terms of moving to that next stage. We had distribution proposals submitted by four uh, distributors. And we, even after one month, we had been through, reviewed all those proposals with the the, the client uh, brand and uh, had, we'd made one distributor appointment. The next two weeks were, were uh, spent fine-tuning the plan around the forecasts, um, around the cost model, get, again, fine-tuning that cost model, agreeing on the, the retail listings budget uh, and the marketing budget. Um, retailer listings uh, can take a, a long time across all the markets. Uh, very, all the retailers uh, have different processes and different committees and different uh, managers that, that products need to be um, that need to be signed off with. Uh, now, in this case, the retailer listings took an incredible amount of time. It took 10 months for this client. And the reason that it took 10 months for this specific client is because they'd already uh, gone into the market using a, a consolidator model, whereby the consolidator was putting a little bit of product into a uh, into both the major retailers in the market. The pricing was probably 50% above where it should have been. There was no marketing, there was no merchandising. So as a result, uh, the, the brand was underperforming um, and the, the listings were very limited and the, the shelf uh, facings were very limited as well. So it took us 10 months um, and the distributor 10 months to, to move that business away from that uh, unviable model, you know, to a model by, whereby we got the pricing to be one of the most competitive yogurt imported brands in the market, strong promotion strategy, strong listing strategy, 13 or 14 facings um, and you know but it did take a long time and I think you know after you know the sale came in two months later but I think the the key insight there was try and get the try and uh, it's really important that you that you get the right part in the first time round because it's much more difficult to undo bad arrangements than it is to to go in fresh to a market so if you're in the fortunate position of Going in fresh to new markets, that's great. Well done. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're in an arrangement which, uh, whereby it's been more of a hands-off arrangement, and you've just let your your trading partner, you know, take care of the pricing strategy and the promotion strategy or the merchandising in a very hands-off way, then perhaps you want to get a bit more involved, um, <clears throat> be a bit more participative, and uh, and really try and uh, turn that business around. I've got one more. Um, I guess uh, case study here, which which fo follows a similar premise, I guess, around preparing the export strategy, which we've covered uh, around um, you know engaging distributors, 12 distributors engaged, four confirmed interest, proposal submitted, and a, a distributor selected. Um, fine tuning the plan only took a month, uh, but for some reason it, it took uh, the distributor and our and our principal. Um, six months to negotiate the distributor agreement and unfortunately that was at the back end of the year where um, retailers typically start closing down it to new listings in November through to March due to Chinese New Year and festive season so we lost a whole chunk of time there and I guess the key insight for us there firstly is be pragmatic with your distribution agreements and, and you know do you need a big lengthy legal agreement or can you cover off something that's a bit more pragmatic while achieving the legalities at the same time? Don't take your foot off the pedal. Keep pushing all the way through. Uh, these delays in our case cost, cost us dearly due to you know, really missing that window um, around, the, 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 around getting in and getting the listing approved before the, the Chinese New Year uh, window closed. So that's our that's our presentation. Um, hopefully, we've shared some uh, some pragmatic insights uh, with you, um, and we look forward to to answering any questions uh, at the end um, if you have any. Uh, if you'd like to to pick up with us afterwards, uh, after and follow up, that's absolutely fine. We'd love to talk. We'd love to learn more about your your brands and your businesses. Um, but I'll hand you back now. Um, to Paul. 
Over to you, Paul. Excellent. Thank you, Cameron, for that. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul North. I'm the Director of Trade with the UK ASEAN Business Council. Uh, thank you, David, Emma and Cameron, for your very informative um, presentations. Um, as UK ASEAN Business Council, I'd like to give you a little bit of um, overview of the bigger picture of, of ASEAN and what we are doing as a, as a trade organisation. So this has been mentioned uh, a couple of times in, in, in our colleagues' presentations, but what is ASEAN? It is the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which was established back in 1967 to accelerate cultural development, economic growth and social progress throughout the region. And since 1967, it's grown to include 10 countries. Those 10 countries you can see up on the screen there, Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. All very, very diverse, economically, culturally, and politically, from the high-tech market of Singapore, of which you've heard uh, a tremendous amount about uh, this morning, to the recently opened up market of Myanmar, a country that has nothing and needs absolutely everything. It has a young, dynamic consumer market with a population of over 630 million, with an average age of just 26. It is the fastest growing economy in the world. It is the sixth largest economy in the world, and is expected to be the fourth largest after the US, China, and EU within the next decade. ASEAN is similar in part to other single markets with the slow and steady integration of economies, but a couple of differences, it has no common currency and it has no free movement of people. ASEAN is spending around, to give you an idea, about 45 billion sterling a year on infrastructure projects, and that's expected to continue for the next 10 years. And off the back of that, there's obviously a lot of other sectors associated with that for um, further opportunities. It is where the growth is. We've mentioned that growth. We've mentioned the diversity. It's a multilingual talent pool of over 630 million. And this has created a huge middle class consumer base where we've seen GDP per capita rise 70 percent from 2007 to around and i'll give it you in dollars it's around four thousand us dollars um, last year there's a huge massive investment in infrastructure as i mentioned and this is ranging from bridge road initiative projects to individual country plans a lot of far, foreign direct investment from the likes of china japan korea and also a lot of um, investment from aid agencies. Longer term, ASEAN's growth will continue to be shaped by economic policies, the regional trade policies that it has, the investment incentives, and that um, continuation of infrastructure financing capacities and capabilities. Just to give you an idea of other sectors uh, and, and, and high value sector opportunities, which we call them across ASEAN. And um, these are the sectors where the government believes that it can add value and where businesses will have a strong return on investment. If you are not there, uh, don't worry too much about it. But as I say, these are the major sectors across the ASEAN markets you can see education, infrastructure, healthcare, uh, major um, business opportunities across the marketplace. However, I'll just give you and show you a snapshot here of um, live export opportunities uh, from about a couple of months ago. And you can see there that, there, that we have um, opportunities across 26 uh, sectors. And you can see some of the big sector opportunities there, construction, education, training, healthcare, and medical. You may not be surprised to see that the top export opportunities within those 26 sectors 
was retail luxury food and drink. Food and drink where the British brands are seen as quality. So where do we fit into to the whole picture here? So um, UK ASEAN Business Council, we are the leading UK based organization promoting trade and investment between the UK and ASEAN dynamic markets. We were created out of then UK trade and investment, now the Department of International Trade, and the UK strategy Britain open for business. We were a government organization. We have now for several years now been a, a private uh, business council, helping companies of all sizes build new contacts, provide market insights, raise the awareness of the vast commercial developments in what is undoubtedly one of the most exciting, vibrant and fastest growing regions in the world. We also bring ASEAN to the UK through a sustained calendar of country briefings, targeted meetings, one-to-one -one clinics, promotional events, webinars as we are doing today. And in addition, we signpost practical advice and guidance on how to do business in ASEAN and can provide access to a considerable network of useful contacts. I just want to hover around um, some of our partners in the next couple of slides. Uh, we are working closely with the UK and ASEAN governments, key partner organisations, including the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN. And you've heard from uh, David Kelly earlier on regarding the British Chambers of Commerce in Singapore and the um, services that they provide for UK exporters looking to move into their market. And I'll, I'll, I'll come to a little bit more of that. Um, we are working with influential corporates, experienced MSEs, SMEs, market experts and professional service providers. And we've created, I would say, an extensive UK ASEAN business network that links UK innovation and expertise with ASEAN commercial developments. So we're working there with eight of the British Chambers of Commerce in ASEAN, there's a couple of business groups in Laos and uh, Brunei, and we're waiting to see what type of services they have in country to be able to support UK exporters looking into their markets. We should not forget our, our, our other DIT and governmental departments who are also working extremely closely with. And in my particular role as Director of Trade, I'm working with many of the trade associations here in the UK as well as the Chambers of Commerce and when I say Department for International Trade it's not just at the headquarters in London it's across the nine English regions uh, working with the DIT teams and international trade advisors. Really building up that awareness of ASEAN and the opportunities of, um, that are available in the marketplace. These are uh, yeah, our, our partners that we are working with, the, the top row there is our corporate partners. Um, you can see there's quite some large influential companies there. They're not only big here in the UK, but they're also extremely influential and big in the ASEAN region. All our British Chambers of Commerce and business groups, as well as the ASEAN uh, governments here in the UK. So I just wanted to highlight a little bit about our in-country partners. These are our organizations in the ASEAN markets that we are working with and we are uh, referring companies into them for that next stage of that journey of um, particularly uh, looking for um, partners and distributors in the marketplace. I won't um, linger on it too much because uh, David in his presentation showed you what the UK, what uh, the, the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore is offering for UK exporters into the marketplace. And really this is a mirror image across the rest of our eight partners um, within the region there. I'd like to just highlight the fact that um, we generally have uh, a biannual visit from our colleagues in uh, from the British Chambers of Commerce, collectively known as Britain in Southeast Asia, and they are here for seven days, 10 days, twice a year, touring the UK and holding one-to-one -one meetings in particular cities. We were very fortunate to have them earlier in the year, uh, just before the lockdown, 
and uh, we hope that we will um, get them back uh, later in the year. It's normally October, we'll see how that goes, but it's a great opportunity for you to be put in front of country experts and they can tell you there and then whether there is a business opportunity for your product or services. So just a little bit about um, our digital platform. I do encourage you really to go and have a look at that, ukabc.org.uk. Huge amount of information that we have um, on the website. A lot of publications there which are downloadable, all about doing business in ASEAN. We also have um, our events page there. And that's not just events which are coming up and what we are doing here in the UK but it's also events that are happening within the region. And that could be particularly interesting for companies who are looking to, to take a trip into the region uh, and want to sort of um, make that trip uh, a little bit more comprehensive around uh, an expo, around a conference, around a, a summit. So um, we are launching uh, very, very shortly, it'll go up either today or Tuesday, I think, our, our new webinar program which is all about doing business in, in ASEAN. It will be country specific, it will be sector specific. All you need to know about moving um, into these vibrant markets of ASEAN. We of course do a lot or have been doing a lot, um, physical events, um, which everything as you probably know is, is on lockdown at the moment. And we're seeing now how we can turn many of those physical events into virtual events. So please watch this. Um, space. We also on there have um, export opportunities. These are live export opportunities that are currently available in the ASEAN markets and uh, if you click on there it will give you full details of, of um, companies in ASEAN and what they are looking for from UK exporters. So this is a team, um, a small team of, of six of us headed up by our executive director Ross Hunter. We are based in uh, Millbank Tower. Uh, for those of you who don't know that, we're, we're just down there from, if you have a look at the picture there, we're just down there from the Houses of, uh, of Parliament. And we have um, Tate Britain Gallery to the left of us and MI5 to the right of us. So we're, we're fairly, fairly secure up there on the 15th floor. And uh, well, that's me. That's the end of the presentation. I hope that's been useful to you. And um, any questions or anything, um, I'm here to assist on that. Um, in the meantime, David, I'll hand back to you. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Thank you. Um, and, you know, from someone that's come from industry and now working on the chamber side, I, I hope that those three presentations were helpful. Um, I wish I knew that I had the support from a regional chamber in market from an organisation like Insight that can help accelerate that support um, and from the UK ASEAN Business Council as well. So hopefully that summary of, 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 of all three organisations demonstrates um, some, some, some great value for you. Um, we have got a couple of questions coming through. Um, I've got a couple I just want to start with first. Um, and the first one's to Emma. So I think if Emma, Paul, myself, if we can just sort of keep hovering over the, uh, the mute yourself, unmute yourself, and we can keep answering, and Cameron as well. Um, just, just a quick one for, for Emma and Cameron. Distribution models for the current export, uh, you know, uh, business in ASEAN. What, what, are, what are the things that are really working and what's not working? Um, and I guess there's two parts to that question. One is um, generally what works and what doesn't, um, but also now specifically with COVID. Um, uh, can, can you sort of put a, put a bit of a, a frame around that? Emma, should I take that one? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'll just quickly turn my turn my video on as well. Um, I think there's generally a, a continuum of, uh, and, and we see this across even a lot of our large clients around how much they they want to kind of participate in the business and and what we what we see is that you know generally exporting sometimes starts as a bit of a hands off uh, business. You know you're obviously busy uh, busy with your domestic business. You've probably got some other core markets and some opportunities come along and it's just easy to jump on them. But the challenge with that is that if you don't if you don't get involved early 
and you don't really engage on on setting a strategy which is going to give you a, a good long term uh, you know chance of survival in the market in terms of getting your getting your pricing right, uh, getting your your distribution right, getting um, getting your promotion and your merchandising right. Um, these markets are so uh, they're so global and there's so much competition that if you're just putting your product on the shelf and expecting it to turn on itself, it, you know, to to sell on its own steam, there's a unless you're a Coca-Cola or a Cadbury, you've got a very low chance of that happening. And so some of the more hands-off models typically are that you may you may sell to a, a trading house in the UK. And that that trading house has a relationship with a a retailer in um, in one of the Southeast Asian markets, but the, sometimes the challenge with that market that with that uh, model is that you kind of lose that participation because that relationship that you've developed is not with the end customer per se; it's with kind of an intermediary. So, I've, in ten years of doing this. Um, our view is that the most the most sustainable model is to put the time and the energy and and the investment into a point into working through a process and engaging lots of different in the market on the ground distribution partners you know working through a, a distribution planning exercise with them to really understand what their plan is and then really appointing the strongest partner and then working with them over the long term and by doing that you you have say in the strategy you can work with them on the marketing strategy. You can work with them on the pricing strategy and the promotion strategy. And you just it gives you such a better chance of success. And you know, having somebody on the ground in each market means that you know you've got a, a guardian in effect that is um, that is taking care of your brand and that is interfacing with the the, the grocers and the retailers to make sure that. You know, uh, if there are out of stock situations, things are being remedied quickly. Any any challenges, you know, can be taken care of. Any any opportunities can be taken advantage of. So, yeah, my my message would be take your time. You know, put the energy into appointing a good on the ground in market partner. And you know, we we, we work with a number of UK brands and, and Australian brands, and you know, we've been quite amazed at how many. You know, significant brands have kind of taken that hands-off approach, and we really feel that there are some really good opportunities. There are some great opportunities for UK brands. Uh, the UK, um, you know, brand market isn't as saturated in our markets as the New Zealand and the Australian offerings. So we we really feel that you know, with the strength of the food safety program that the UK brings, the strength of the branding. You know the strength of the, the the history that the UK has with a lot of these markets is a great opportunity, but it needs to be thought out well to make sure that you're getting all those those core elements correct. That's a very long answer, but that's my answer. Thanks, Cameron. That that's really really helpful, and it's it's just worth sort of noting for the audience as well that. Uh, there is the SG UK partnership for the future, which was signed between both the Singapore government and the UK government to really strengthen the, tr the flow trade, the trade, the trade flow between both countries. So there's a huge opportunity there to um, uh, to maximise on the on the partnership between both countries. The other thing that's really important to mention is that there's also um, the 30 by 30 program in Singapore, where you know Singapore imports a lot of uh, of, of F and B, and they're looking at ways of uh, cultivating. Curating 30% um, of food um, uh, by 2030. So there are opportunities there for those in the supply chain as well to look at that opportunity as well. Um, a quick question that's come through uh, says, do the British Chambers of Commerce have a, uh, a list of main Singaporean FMV distributors which import from the UK? Um, are there some main players? And um, yes, we do. And um, so there are two or three sort of key F&B events a year in Singapore that we try and support companies through trade missions on. Typically, uh, the importers are invited to those sort of events. Um, um, absolutely. And um, for those that are, are absolutely keen on, on getting that sort of information, I'm sure Insight and certainly the Chamber, we can we can help you to put you in touch with with some of that activity as well. Um, Return on investment, um, marketing and promotion. Now, obviously, you know, from a brand perspective, sat in the UK specifically during this time, where we're all looking at sort of costs and how we how we keep our for for a number of us how we keep our businesses going. Um, 
what advice can you give to um, brand owners for the best possible return on investment when they're looking at the ASEAN market? And um, I, I guess that, you know, from being involved in business previously, um, ASEAN is quite complicated. There isn't the same freedom of movement of people. There isn't a single currency. We know that the general narrative is that we try and compare it to Europe, et cetera. But from a return investment perspective, looking at exploring the market, and I, I'm putting this to the insight guys, and I might pass this back to Paul as well. Um, can you provide any best advice on in terms of return investment from a business perspective? Okay, I'll, I'll just provide a little bit uh, first before perhaps Paul can jump in as well. Um, we we're pretty pragmatic in our approach. Uh, generally, the just to I, I guess give you the, um, the the standard in terms of how that uh, the marketing and promotion works on the launch of a new brand uh, in the market. Um, typically. The, the 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 most important thing uh, to do in the in the early stages is firstly to establish a distribution because marketing and promotion without being available you know without uh, consumers being available to, without consumers being able to find you to buy you is a bit of a waste of time so what we would say is get your distribution right first uh, and then typically uh, in the early stages anyway. Um, brands should focus on uh, in-store activity. So, you know, TV advertisements and magazine advertisements in the early stages, I, I would argue, are, you know, not ne totally necessary. Most of our brands will put all their, their marketing budget in the early stages into retailer-led promotions. So that's generally, you know, tasting promotions or price promotions to drive uh, consumer trial and, uh, and, and repeat purchase. So that's, you know, your typical, you know, go into a store and, you know, buy two, get one or 30% you know, off or, or whatever it is, you know, complemented with a, a tasting a tasting promotion, which is basically your distributor um, putting people in the stores uh, with samples of your product to hand out samples, you know, to really encourage the, the trial and purchase because, you know, even if you're a, a very well-known UK brand, um, you know, that that's, has great success in, in the UK market, you're, you're to some degree starting again in a new export market. So it's really important to to give consumers the experience of your product um, to ensure that, you know, you, you give them a chance to like your product so they'll continue purchasing. Obviously, that can be complemented with a social media strategy. So a lot of the distributors now are, you know, incorporating social strategies into their um, into their, their marketing strategies. Not all distributors are necessarily good at, at deploying social media, media strategies. So a lot of them will use um, third party kind of providers and the like, uh, but you know, a, a strong social strategy complemented by, you know, those tasting promotions and the price promotions, as well as perhaps uh, key opinion leaders and the like, is a really good, pragmatic, affordable way to start in our view. Excellent. Do you want me Paul, to that, yeah, uh, David. Do you anything to add, Paul? That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, that's some great comments coming on there, and um, yeah, we we are aware that there are organisations there that probably don't have um, sort of the big marketing budgets to be able to a lot of the time get out to the market. But we do know if you, I think we are all really well aware that um, ASEAN, if you want to get into these markets, you got to travel in there you've got to have a, a budget there to um, to market your products and, and push them forward um, obviously times are now very very different um, we've had um, a lot of missions pulled um, obviously because of travel restrictions um, but um, you know post covid we will still continue to be able to support um, missions into the region. Having said that, um, for, for organizations that may not have um, such big marketing budgets, there are organizations that we are working with here in the UK um, that offer sales and marketing services for the smaller British brands and helping them to get into the ASEAN marketplaces. So they are doing um, you know, a lot of sales and marketing, getting the product in front of potential distributors in the marketplace and um, helping those smaller brands with the lower budgets into into market 
we 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 are also um, talking at this moment in time with one of the largest supermarket brands within the region. Um, I'm not going to mention their name, but I think many of our colleagues here today will know who that is. Um, and they are looking to bring the lesser known British brands into the marketplace. So there could be an opportunity for the delegate there to, to hook into that program that we are starting. And I'm, I'm more than happy to, to take that up and, and have a discussion. One of the other things that we are looking at because we've had to pull our physical missions into the region is how we can turn that uh, physical mission into a virtual mission. And um, that could again be all about doing business in the region um, uh, and, and briefings, um, but also an opportunity that we may be able to send over um, uh, companies branded products into the marketplace and have our in-country market um, partners then do a little bit work with brand managers in order to get those products in front of potential distributors and partners in the marketplace. So that's where we can help on that particular side. I'm more than happy to uh, have, a, have a, a conversation with those organizations that are interested in doing that. Paul, if I can just stick with you, there's a really interesting question here around um, do we know how far talks have progressed between Thailand and the UK? So the trade agreement says the UK has come out of the EU. Um, is there, can, can you provide a general narrative um, around some of the conversations that you know are happening, um, specifically around sort of food and drink import and export? Yeah, the general narrative is we don't know. <laughs> um, talks are ongoing. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the trade discussions um, are sort of being held back a little bit with the with the current situation. Um, but we know this is an important subject for um, UK exporters. Uh, we will be holding a webinar. Um, I believe it would be uh, towards the end of May now, um, uh, along with some trade advisors and um, particularly with the. Um, uh, HMRC, Customs and uh, Revenue people, who are um, seeing what that picture will be post EU Brexit. Um, so we'll have a, a lot of uh, a better ideas by then, and they will. A lot of the uh, HMRC people are obviously on um, looking at um, different situations at this moment in time, how COVID-19 is affecting imports and exports out of the UK. Um, but uh, they will be picking that up again very, very shortly. And um, as I say, we'll be we'll be putting a webinar out there on on how that um, is looking. So currently, we we just have to hold on for a little bit. Thanks, Paul. And I think, needless to say, when news does come out from the ASEAN region, I'm sure you'll be having that on your website. And similar for Singapore, when we know about the free trade agreement, um, obviously the negotiations are, are, or the conversations are ongoing. Um, but once we know more, we will certainly make sure that we provide that information out. Uh, I'm going to loop two quick questions together. Um, one is around sort of the growth category in Singapore. Um, the second is around condiments more specifically. Um, in terms of products coming to market, um, there might be, um, th there are some key markets that are growing. Um, Emma mentioned one of them around sort of the um, the meatless categories um, and the uh, sort of the, the green farming piece, which is sort of growing in Singapore. It's, it's high on their agenda now. Um, in terms of condiments, um, it's quite difficult to answer that question specifically around the requirement in Singapore. Um, a lot of it is around um, sort of ensuring that we get products in front of the right buyers and sort of test that marketplace. So um, I would definitely suggest um, to Rose, um, get in touch with Insight or ourselves and we can see how we can help you. Um, so to Insight, I mean, are there any sort of key growth categories that you're seeing in Singapore? I mean, obviously the agritech sector, the, the 30 by 30 um, program that Singapore's put in place. Um, there are some sort of um, opportunities that you highlighted in, in, in your presentation, Emma. Are there, are there some key growth areas that you think we should be highlighting specifically? Uh, let, let me take that one. Um, I, I think there are, you know, I, I would say this year, <clears throat> more than probably any year over the last 10 years, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing the, the development more of, of this, you know, 
more dynamic um, style of products such as the meatless categories. Um, we there's been a lot of talk over the years around those you know more the the, the niche categories as well as the um, the more environmentally um, driven categories and the like. And <clears throat> it's only really this year I think that we're really seeing you know strong movement into those more alternative categories, which I think is really exciting. Um, I think the traditional categories though are, are always there. We've over the last probably five years, we've probably launched three or four yogurt brands, a couple of ice cream brands, some, uh, uh, quite a number of snack brands as well. And you know, even in those traditional categories, there still is strong demand. But you know, I'd, again, I'd, I'd, I know I go on about this a little bit, but I'd, I'd bring it back to the opportunity. And the opportunity is yes, it's a category, but it's also the business opportunity from a, a margin perspective for the distributor and the retailer. You know, can they actually make margin? Can they make money out of this? Is is the export price right? You know, in any category, be it traditional or a, a new dynamic innovative category, at the end of the day, <clears throat> what the distributor is really interested in is making money, right? So there has to be enough money in it and enough perceived value in the product from a consumer perspective. Um, for the distributor to get interested, because you know, if you're looking at a, if you're looking at the chilled category, for example, the frozen category in Singapore, 15% of a distributor's margin is eaten up on logistics and warehousing alone, you know, and that's a considerable amount of margin, right? And when you when you consider that an average margin, you know, distributor margin is at 25 to 35% in Singapore, that's nearly half their margin is just sitting in in logistics and and their warehousing, so it has to be, it has to make sense from them from a from a category perspective, yes, but also from a from a business perspective as well. Thanks, Cameron. That that's really helpful. There's there's a really good operational question here as well um, around the marketing budgets of small of small brands. Um, you know, if, if those if, if companies that are looking to export that have that have got a great product and that and the market works for them, but they haven't got a huge marketing budget. So I'm giving Insight the opportunity to sort of sell this. Um, you know, how how can you help those the, the sort of smaller brands to get access to the market? Is is there a is there a product or a service that you provide for the, the those that haven't got a huge marketing budget? Um, the, the reality, uh, yes. The, I mean, the, there are there are ways into the market. I mean, your your scope is some is somewhat uh, dependent on your investment. Um, there are um, costs associated with generally with entering supermarket or grocery channels within, um, you know, within any of the ASEAN markets. The only exception where you can get into the market without necessarily paying to get on the shelf is in Korea, which is outside the scope of this uh, conversation because it's not really an ASEAN market. Um, but there are costs that that do <coughs> unfortunately need to be paid, but you know there are some pretty exciting things happening in some markets for example at the moment like singapore you've got redmart uh which is the the major online uh retailer which is owned by lazada um, and alibaba um whereby you don't have to pay anything necessarily for the privilege of getting your product into their system which is great um Fair Price, which is one of the two major uh, retailers in in Singapore, also has just developed an online platform. Uh, now, typically, to get your products listed into Fair Price, you have to pay, you know, a per a per SKU per store fee, um, you know, to get into however many number of stores that you want to get into. But this new online platform allows you to list the product onto the online platform. Uh, without any cost, you you only have access to the online platform rather than the bricks and the mortar stores. But it is arguably a way that you can you, that you can potentially um, access you know a relatively large, well-known channel without having to pay too much in the way of fees or costs. But it is you know while there is you know there's no, there's no doubt that there's a, there's some great opportunities for the UK for for the UK and the UK brands. For the the reasons I outlined before, but to some degree, it is a pay-to-play model across across the markets, the ASEAN markets, in terms of paying for the privilege of selling your products into into the retailers. Um, but 
you know, if if you're if you've got a product that is in demand, and you know, you've got distributors that are very keen on the opportunity and and at, at looking at carrying your brand. You, if, if the distributors and the retailers are very keen, then you've obviously got a lot more room for negotiation on those costs. So, um, yeah, there are some free channels, but the the reality, unfortunately, is to to access those you know more mainstream channels that that you obviously have in the UK. There, there is some cost involved in that. Thanks, Cameron. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'm going to group a couple of questions together, if that's okay. And I'm going to, I'm, I hope I hope this isn't throwing you under the bus, but is if the, a couple of people have sort of mentioned specific categories, specific products, is there, can you just sort of quickly highlight whether there is an opportunity in ASEAN for grocery products, for bottled water and for frozen frozen food? Just very quickly, just to cover sort of three of them off. Are, are there opportunities in the region for those those types of products? Uh, bottled water, uh, it's a it's it's a very competitive category. It depends on which which segment of the market. Whether you're going in with your traditional kind of more plastic, uh, you know, more mainstream uh, everyday drinking water, or you're going in with more of a a glass, you know, highly branded uh, product supported by a strong marketing strategy. I would argue probably that that there's more opportunity for the higher end product uh, in more specialty channels. Than there is in uh, in your more commodity kind of typical bot bottled water. Uh, on the frozen on the frozen category, yes, totally. Um, the only thing to consider, it's difficult to give a blanket answer on because I'm not sure exactly what those frozen products are. But the, a couple of the considerations on frozen are, you know, the sophistication of the market. So markets like Singapore, Hong Kong. Uh, Korea, Taiwan, uh, Malaysia have very developed supply chains. So when I talk about developed supply chains, I'm talking about you know trucks and warehouses that have you know that are set up to to handle um, and maintain temperature over a long period of time. Markets like uh, you know Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, um, you know they're more developing in terms of that uh, infrastructure. So you know up until a few years ago. We were seeing situations where supermarkets in the Philippines were turning their freezers off at night, right? Which, you know, so if you're a frozen product and you're sitting in the freezer, uh, you know, it's not a great scenario to be in. So if, if I was in that frozen category, if I was a brand owner, especially if it's a UK brand, which probably carries a premium with it because of the the food safety, the quality, the the high manufacturing and the like, I'd be focusing my efforts more on the, the more developed markets of uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, probably Korea as well. Thank you. Thanks, Cameron. Um, I realise that we've gone ever so slightly over time, but some of the questions have been absolutely fantastic. What I'm going to suggest to the um, uh, to the panel is uh, perhaps we can sort of digest some of the questions and um, you know perhaps get back to back to everybody with with some of these answers if that's okay. Um, I'd specifically like to thank Emma and Cameron. Thank you very, very much for your insights. Really, really fascinating. Great to see that, you know, from a from a, a company's perspective and those that are still on the line. Um, great to see that you've got the support there from the UK ASEAN Business Council, from Insight, from the British Chamber regionally, and also as Paul had mentioned in his presentation, and I mentioned sort of the the Britain in Southeast Asia, the other the other chambers in region. We are here to support you. So, um, getting thinking about where you can export your products. Um, uh, to now is a is a great time whilst there's, there's potentially a little bit of downtime we can get some thinking about where where the future growth is going to come from so um we'll make sure that a lot of this content a lot of the uh, the slides i think we've got a recording of this as well so we'll make sure that everybody gets this and those that weren't able to join in or have had to leave early can can have access to it and um it's a final thanks from me uh, and from the british chamber of commerce in singapore um to all those that have been on the call for all the questions we'll, we'll certainly try and get back to you with all of those um, and thank you for an engaging session today